started. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, my name is Courtney Doggart. I'm the president of Network 2020. Um, here today uh, to bring you Uniting a World in Crisis, the role of the UN in its 75th year. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Network 2020 is a New York-based nonprofit that bridges the gap between the foreign policy worlds and the private sector. Um, and we really try to leverage a lot of different expertise from emerging and established leaders to find innovative solutions to critical foreign policy challenges. So uh, that is who we are. And, um, and please do check out our website or follow us on uh, Twitter or Instagram or all the other outlets to, to learn more about what we do. So we're very happy today to have a panel um, that will be led by Network 2020 board member Lisa Rhodes. So Lisa uh, has been a Network 2020 board member for several years. She's participated in, um, in our research trips as well. And she is the founda founder and managing director of our private equity healthcare company and has a long history in business um, she holds a Master of Business Administration from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of Music from the Curtis Institute of Music. And she currently teaches entrepreneurship and serves on the boards of the Turtle Bay Music School in addition to Network 2020. Uh, and then we have Richard Gowan. Uh, and uh, Richard Gowan is the uh, UN Director at the International Crisis Group where he oversees the crisis group's advocacy work at the United Nations, uh, liaising with diplomats and UN officials in New York. He has, um, he has both a lot of academic experience um, as well as having worked as a consultant for the UN. So he comes to this topic from a couple of different angles. And then last but not least, we have Herten Vandenecker, who is a uh, multi-decade diplomat with uh, careers both in the uh, I believe in the Dutch Foreign Service as well as he's worked at the UN. Uh, and with the EU. And so he is currently playing a key role for the EU in Geneva, leading on global health issues and social affairs, including COVID-19. And he is coordinating with the EU27 on these matters. So he uh, has a lot of, a lot of experience uh, in the UN, both in Geneva and previously at headquarters in New York. Um, I regret that we could not hear from Sophia Borges today, but hopefully at some other point. Um, so with that, I am going to turn this over to Lisa for the conversation, which will take about half an hour, and then we'll turn to the Q&A box. If at any time you have any questions, please do feel free to put them in the Q&A box. So over to you, Lisa. Terrific. Thank you, Courtney, and great to be here. And thank you both, uh, Kristen and Richard, for joining us and, uh, and welcoming your insights along the way. So the discussion today, the title of this discussion is Uniting a World in Crisis, and boy, are we in crisis on a global basis like we've never been before. And so what is the role of the UN, particularly in its 75th year anniversary? Hard to believe the UN is basically the age of our presidential candidates, whichever one will be um, to that. And, the say, uh, and, and we are now looking at these changing opportunities that we have. So we'd like to dig into the role that she played in the past, the role that she's gonna play in the future in this post COVID world, hopefully a post COVID world. And when we're moving away from these traditional roles that most countries have played, is there an opportunity or a reason for concern? Um, I always believe that a good crisis should never be wasted. So what we want to do here is get the views from our very knowledgeable panelists on what the UN is now, what their core principles are, how it will change in this world and in the future, and how can the UN help shape this new world that we're moving into. So I'd like to just start that off and lead the dialogue by saying first, what do you think the, gentlemen, what do you think the role of the UN is right now during this crisis? And is it different than it has been in past crises? Um, so maybe Richard, you want, um, Richard might want to start here given your expertise as consulting with the UN and then Gertrude can follow with that. Well, I mean, I think what the crisis has really brought out is what a complicated beast the UN is because you ask what is the UN's role in this crisis, uh, you know, the answer could be the World Health Organization, uh, despite facing a lot of criticism, is still leading the charge to deal with the public health consequences of COVID. That's the UN agency. Uh, then again, you have the World Food Programme, another UN agency based out of Rome, that is trying to deal with the massive disruptions to food supply chains. 
uh, that have arisen from COVID and which are threatening um, hunger and starvation in parts of the world. Then you have um, the UN General Assembly, which is meeting today in a special session to talk about um, organizing the distribution of a vaccine. You have the UN Security Council, which um, has been talking about managing uh, conflicts and instability that might arise from, from COVID. I mean, I could take the next hour just going through different bits of the UN that are dealing with this crisis. Not all of them are doing very well. Uh, tensions between China and the US, for example, stop the Security Council responding quickly to the pandemic. But what I take away from this very difficult, very messy situation is actually a positive, which is that we have an astonishingly well-developed um, multilateral system. It's unprecedented in history. It's actually um, proving quite resilient and quite relevant during the COVID pandemic. It gets things wrong, but overall the UN is actually providing a global safety net during a period of crisis. Um, but it's very, very hard to say what is the UN doing because it's actually doing many, many different things, wearing many different hats. Mm, that's great, Richard. So you have a very positive take on this and you see that the role is, is very important and it's leading in, in a variety of ways, which is very good. Um, Britton, can you give us a little bit of perspective from what you're doing? Because your expertise right now and your role is healthcare. So how <laughs> relevant to experience is that during this crisis? We'd love to hear from you. And who would have expected that when I uh, when I joined the Dutch Foreign Service years ago? Um, <laughs> Richard is right. Uh, I, I agree with his analysis, and I'll try to to complement a little bit. Um, first of all, the UN is as strong as the member states wanted to be. Huh? Uh, uh, the UN in itself is is not an entity that that has a lot of uh, leverage. It's it's really how the member states are performing in the system. I also agree with Richard that when you look at the organogram of the UN, and it's in fact on the UN website, it's mind boggling. I showed it to my kids and they're, you know, even after a couple of years studying it, it's, it's impossible to grasp. Um, what I found quite amazing is the relatively quick uh, response from uh, a couple of UN agencies that really mattered in, in fighting the crisis. Um, I, I'm the WHO, for example, I mean, it received a lot of criticism, especially in the United States. Um, and obviously, those two countries, China and the United States, have tried to politicize uh, the whole issue of COVID. But on the other hand, uh, given the, 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 the dynamics within the WHO, it was quite remarkable how relatively quickly uh, the WHO reacted and for example also that all those all the member states of the WHO in the World Health Assembly agreed to a resolution how to deal with COVID including China and the United States. Uh, the ILO has also been very active. Uh, they came with the immediate analysis on the socio-economic impact of the crisis. What I'm really worried about is not so much how we try to synchronize all these different elements of the UN into an overall UN approach, because paper is patient, as they say in my language, uh, and there is enough uh, capa analysis capacity in the United Nations, but it's the financial element to it. Uh, we don't know yet what the impact of COVID will be on the overseas development assistance of member states. And even in my own group of countries, the EU27, and as you know, or as many of you know, the EU is most of the time by far the largest donor to many UN agencies. It's not clear yet what the crisis will do on the fine on financing development assistance, hence also on financing the UN. That's one. And secondly, this crisis has taught us that uh, the it, it's it, that the capacity of the UN at country level is crucial because the UN has been analyzing the situations in developing countries in a certain way, and they came up with, the, they have come up with a business plan, but now due to the COVID crisis, they have to refocus their attention. They have to refocus their projects and programs. And that's, that will be quite significant. The UN is not really used to do that. Uh, and that, and that in combination with the financial aspect of it, uh, will ens ensures that, ensures that we are going to, face very difficult times, I think, in the UN. So it sounds, it sounds like there's a lot of financial concern 
that the UN is having, it's also the same same concern that most of the other countries around the world are doing. So how does this financial concern sort of impact the ability of the UN and what can you guys, what can the UN do to support the programs that you're doing? Um, are they just reliant upon countries' contributions or are there other things that can be done to support UN initiatives? The question is uh, directed to whom? To me? Yeah, to yeah. And, okay. and, and you, can, you can both chime in. I'd love both of your opinions on this. Well, I believe, I mean, I've been involved in the fifth committee of the UN for a couple of years, which is a finance and budget committee. And every time we discussed UN finances, the EU was very open about, uh, let's say, allowing the private sector, the business community, foundations, et cetera, et cetera, to, first of all, be, incre make, be increasingly involved in the decision making of the UN, but secondly, also to really support public private partnerships uh, in in this sense because as we all know the the, the financial footprint of the un is really small um, so in that sense the heavy reliance on government funding and for certain uh, funds and programs even voluntary based contributions it makes it a vo very volatile situation so so i would say public private partnerships and i think the COVID crisis uh, it gives us ample opportunity to also look at the pharmaceutical industry because that that cooperation is definitely growing. Um, but that will also mean that we might need to refocus on the decision making processes in the UN, which is now still very government based. Many EU delegations in New York, in when the, when we have the General Assembly in September, have have uh, participants from the private sector, from trade unions, from youth organizations, from academia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but that's not the case in 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 most of the other um, delegations of, uh, of of UN member states. So I would I would say, open it up. <laughs> open it up to different financing. Richard, anything you want to add to that? Well, it, it is worth saying that again. You know, different parts of the UN have different funding models. And if you're looking at something like UN Peacekeeping, which I guess is one of the organization's main brands, that is entirely funded by governments. And um, the US and China and Japan and the EU, most of it. Interestingly, it's different in the health world. Um, for some time, uh, big uh, philanthropies and most obviously patients have actually been uh, leading contributors to the work of the DOE. Gates Foundation, uh, in most years recently, has actually spent almost all countries except the US and the UK uh, on the activities of the World Organization, mainly for Germany. So the field is one where the private sector is already engaged, philanthropies are already engaged, and um, we may see that that continue. But I worry that in areas where governments are responsible for spending, uh, you are going to see funding dry up. We've already seen the UK announce that it's going to significantly cut its aid budget, and mm. the Brits are a leader in this field. And I, I think Gerson is right. Um, it's going to be very hard for a lot of governments to tell voters that we should be spending on the UN when we're having to cut budgets at home due to the COVID recession. So it, it will be a rough period. Yeah. So it sounds like a, a real challenge is the financial challenges that not only co individual countries are facing, but the UN will be facing that as a derivative thereof. Um, makes sense. So in this world, let's sort of change the subject a little bit here. Um, the UN has always had, um, has always been talking about multilateralism, trying to promote that globally. And as the world had become very global pre-COVID, um, it is now changing dramatically to much more nationalistic. And certain every country is really changing their roles. The US has pulled back, China's pull pulling forward. How are these interests changing? the fabric of the UN? And how do you see an, this as an opportunity or is there concerns about this? And particularly maybe looking at China's role, growing role in the UN and growing role on a global basis. So Richard, could you address that first and see, give us some thoughts on, on that perspective? The, the rise of China in the UN is without doubt the most striking 
trend I've seen in the organization. And I, I've been covering it uh, uh, since 2005, based in New York. Um, in 2005, even in 2010, China was really a non-factor in most UN discussions. Chinese officials were generally very low profile, um, had very little influence over the organization. And then over the last decade, we've really seen that change. And it's become very clear that Beijing feels that with its power rising, um, it should have a much greater role in shaping UN policy. Uh, China has been securing quite a lot of top jobs in UN agencies um, for its nationals. Uh, it's been really pressing uh, UN bodies like the Security Council to endorse the Belt and Road Initiative. And through all this activity, frankly, I, I think it's, it's worried a lot of member states who um, wonder where, you know, where China's influence is leading. And it's created a massive rift with the US um, in the Trump era. The Obama administration wanted to cooperate with China on issues like climate change, viewed China's rise at the UN as a um, pure threat. And what we've seen culminating in the China-US debates over COVID and the WHO is a new sort of Cold War type tension emerging between Washington and Beijing over who owns the UN system. And I think that is very true. Um, we're not back in the Cold War. It's, it's nothing like as bad as it was in the UN system in the, the days of the Soviet US tensions, but it is making it a lot harder for um, you know, UN officials like Secretary General Guterres and UN agencies um, to nab problems like COVID because big power politics keep on getting in the way. And I think this you know, this has been the story of the UN for the last five years. It's going to be the story that shapes the UN for the next 10 years. So you say China's reshaping it. And what, where do you think China wants to, what, what does China want to achieve? Um, and how can we, uh, and is that globally, it's only at odds with the US or is it at with odds with any of the European countries or other countries globally? Well, I, I mean, Gerton should speak to the, the European dimension because yeah. I think the EU actually had a very interesting role in this period, trying to keep the multilateral system going and avoid a Cold War style system. Um, what I, I mean, what I would say briefly, though, is that there are some areas where I think everyone, excluding Trump, uh, uh, sees opportunities for common ground with Beijing. And most obviously, that's true on climate change. You cannot have serious UN climate diplomacy involving China. Um, on the other hand, China finds itself increasingly under pressure, actually, at the UN over human rights issues, where its position on human rights and its own human rights record vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Uyghurs um, are bringing it into light in New York and Geneva. It's getting a lot of criticism. Um, China, I think, would like a UN system that doesn't take human rights seriously and certainly doesn't look at China's internal affairs seriously. Um, but you know, the US, but also the EU has been pushing back against that. So it's, it's a very complicated picture. Mm -hmm. Gerton, you want to follow up on the perspective that the EU has had on the rising role of China in the UN? First of all, I would like to say that I fully concur with uh, Richard's analysis. Uh, not that long ago, I entered uh, the building of UNDESA, which is uh, uh, which is a part of UN focusing on uh, economic and, uh, and 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 development affairs. And uh, the first poster I saw was uh, a poster about what Belt One Road, which was uh, which was saying a lot. Um, and every EU diplomat that sees that immediately notices that DASA has been taken over. That part of the UN has been taken over by the Chinese, that's that's for sure. And obviously in, in negotiations, the, the relationship between, the, between China and the developing countries has traditionally always been very strong. It was called the, it's called the G77 in China, and they often operate as a block in, in, in negotiations. Um, if we've we've tried after we developed the the EAS the EU's global strategy a couple of years ago to reposition ourselves towards uh, China and later on also vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, 
And I think it's fair to say that we realized in the European Union that we had to become much more transact, transact, transactional with, the, with, with China. Sorry for my uh, mispronunciation there. Um, and that we really have to be very firm our own, our, on our own values. Um, and I think while we in, envisaged to do that together with the United States, uh, we obviously were confronted with a, a US government back then a couple of years ago that had that did not really believe in the multilateral approach also saw the EU as a threat the EU 27 uh, to altogether as a threat. And actually was also trying to play out individual EU member states against each other like like China does. Um, um, so in that sense. Um, uh, I believe that now the time has come to uh, reinvigorate that transatlantic relationship again and, and to ensure that the US and the EU go hand in hand towards China. Um, and, and Trump was right on certain issues. Eh? There, there was obviously no level playing field in trade. Uh, there are issues uh, when it comes to data protection and technology and privacy. And, and Richard already mentioned uh, the quite lousy hu uh, human rights track record of the Chinese. I, I believe in a, situ in, a in a situation whereby the EU and the US together would develop a Indo-Pacific strategy. I think that's something that we need to develop together. Uh, we have similar values, we have similar concerns towards China, and we have to create a united front. In fact, not only with uh, between the EU and, and the US, but also with countries like Canada, Australia, uh, uh, Japan. Interestingly enough, China is a partner, it's a competitor and an, uh, and an adversary at, at the same time. Uh, so we need to be firm and we need to put our foot down on certain issues in which we believe in. And we also need to realize that China needs us as well. Um, so in that sense, we should not be afraid. The, the EU has always been a very nice child in the classroom, but sometimes we need to become a little bit more street fighters when it comes to dealing with other with other big big players in the world. Uh, my only concern is, and then I'll stop these, is that, I mean, we should not expect the EU-US relationship to change uh, as of the 20th of January. That's not going to happen. And I fear that Biden will need a lot of time uh, to focus on the economic issues in the United States itself. Um, so that's a bit of a concern uh, that, that I have. On climate change, obviously, we sincerely hope that the EU, China, as well as the US can now really ensure that we take this, uh, this matter uh, further because we have to, we have to increase our, uh, our pace. Wonderful. Thank no, thank you. It sounds like there's a, a lot of common, common themes amongst the, the countries of the world. They're dealing with an rising China. There's some of the good things about that and some of the negative things about that. And I like, uh, I like a lot of that, the point about what you're saying, which is that you have to say that their adversary and friend at the same time. And those are things to do and to learn how to stand your ground, which is really important. So it sounds like, let's go into this um, a question about what the future of the UN is right now. So here you have, the UN has been a major role in trying to pull the world together to help develop countries by support of the leaders in the country. And I think Gertrude, you were saying earlier that the new role of the UN has been helping with healthcare. So you've gone from development, now healthcare is really critical. What is the future? Is the future economic and healthcare? Is it still development in different ways? What are both of your views on what the future of the UN is, what it's thinking to be right now, and what you personally believe it should be for this future? So Gerson, why don't we start with you and then, and then Richard, if you wouldn't mind following up as well. A couple of years ago, the UN came up with the um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030. Now, obviously, due to the pandemic, uh, the emphasis has shifted here and there, uh, or has shifted tremendously, but I still believe that the Sustainable Development Goals are extremely valid, also tackling, tackling the crisis. But I think what we should try is to find a better nexus between um, uh, dealing with healthcare issues, um, uh, socioeconomic uh, aspects in developing countries uh, and issues like uh, democratization, the rule of law, and ensuring obviously that there is also enough attention to issues such as 
uh, emergency food distribution and taking care of refugees, etc. So in that sense, I don't think the UN needs that much of a major overhaul. Uh, and in, in any case, anything that happens in the UN will happen very incrementally. And will, <laughs> you know, time is in that sense on our side because in, things will, will develop uh, relatively slow. I hope that the whole uh, COVID crisis will also make people realize that because of the transnational uh, component of this, uh, of this pandemic, uh, people will see the added value of multilateralism because it has been under threat, uh, as we all know, and the UN is not only part of the system, there are many other parts of the system that, have, that are also part of it and have also suffered like the World Trade Organization. Um, but in that sense, I hope that people will realize that trying to tackle issues such as the pandemic from a global point of view in close cooperation, and Richards was right to point out to initiatives like uh, uh, HIV AIDS prevention, but also Gavi, where uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is already uh, quite, quite, quite involved, that that, that, that concept will, will, will increase. Um, but again, I'm also concerned at the same time about the, the leverage of the UN at country level, because what we will see is when the financial contributions from member states will, will go down, I fear that the field will suffer the most. And that's exactly where it should not uh, happen. Richard, what are your thoughts? I mean, I think, I mean, I think I see that the UN will continue a central role uh, in climate change diplomacy for the reasons we've already touched on. Um, and I think that the, the UN probably will have a significant role in guiding development and uh, attempting to catch up with the ambitions of the Sustainable Development Goals uh, that Gerson um, referred to. Sadly, the COVID recession that we're, we're slipping back on a lot of those goals. But nonetheless, I think that most states agree that the UN should be talking about climate and should be talking about development. Um, it does lots of other technical things that we hardly ever refer to. I mean, the universal postal union ensures that our parcels um, travel between Geneva and New York um, in a regulated fashion. And I think that will continue. Um, I see three areas of concern, um, or three main areas of concern. The first is around security. I think that um, there is a risk that the tension between China, Russia and the US will bear down more and more on the Security Council and on the work of UN envoys and mediators. And sadly, the future may look more and more like Syria, where um, the UN just cannot agree on a security solution. Secondly, human rights. Um, I, you know, I do think that uh, we're seeing a real clash of value systems now, and we've both touched on this already, which means that while UN officials have a huge role standing up for human rights and acting as sort of objective defender of, of values, uh, a lot of countries increasingly do not want to listen. And the last area may turn out to be the most important one, Gurdon touched on it quickly, which is there's a, a huge world of innovation out there now, digital, um, biotech, artificial intelligence, um, many, many things that uh, I, can't, I can't wrap my head around, and the UN can't wrap its head around it either. Um, we don't have UN frameworks for dealing with AI. We don't have... Um, a really serious UN framework for dealing with it with even sort of technologies which are better advanced. Um, and uh, I think that if the UN cannot agree on how to regulate the new world of technology because of you know major power differences, then um, that lack of regulation will uh, be a serious th threat to the organization's relevance as we go through the 21st century. Mm. Very interesting. Thank you. I think that's very interesting. So it sounds like we've got some concerns and, and it's um, what you're talking about on the technology side about regulating technology on the UN side. That's no different from what governments are, are finding right now on a local level that it's really difficult for 
regulations and laws to catch up with what technology can do and what their intent versus their intentions of what they should be doing. So that's a really interesting point, but those, those are really good. Well, gentlemen, I know we're sort of at the end of this, but I'd like to ask you both one, um, one last question and to get you um, to just get you both to say what you would like to communicate, what you would like people to know right now about the UN and the role that you think it should be playing um, now and in the future. Richard, can we start with you? Um, so I would like everyone to know that Secretary of State Pompeo is wrong about the UN. Um, Pompeo said the other week that he thought the goal of the incoming Biden administration re-engaging uh, was to have cool cocktail parties. Uh, and, that, and he said that that's, that's why people do multilateralism, is to have cool cocktail parties. Um, and I, I would, and Pompeo and others um, have made similar points over the last few years, implying that um, the UN is nothing but bureaucrats and diplomats uh, sitting in New York um, throwing back Negronis. Um, firstly, uh, after 15 years around the UN, um, I've, I've yet to go to very many cocktail parties that I think were genuinely cool. Um, and the quality of cocktails is not as high as um, Pompeo supposes. And actually, maybe we should have a UN reform effort to get better cocktail parties. Um, but secondly, actually, um, what for me is the heart of the UN is the work of the people in the field. And that's humanitarians doing food supply in um, uh, the Horn of Africa, that's mediators and aid officials working in Syria under horrible conditions, and that's UN peacekeepers in places like Mali who are coming under regular attack by jihadi forces. Um, actually, that's the real UN. That's the UN on the ground delivering for people. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's actually deeply unfair to the UN to claim that it's nothing but bureaucrats having drinks because it's a lot, lot more than that. Great, thank you, Richard. Gerton, the same question for you. I couldn't agree more with Richard uh, when he referred to uh, humanitarian workers, uh, you know, living in, in, in dire circumstances. Uh, I've seen it with my own eyes when I worked for UNHCR, uh, people with uh, PhDs living, you know, very close to refugee camps for two years in a in a in a prefab uh, uh, container, basically with a case with a case of books. Um, obviously, you know that's a it's a, it's always an individual choice. But if you, whenever I would lose faith in my job, I, I you know the issue would be relatively quickly solved when you would take a duty trip to a country like Mozambique, where I served, and see with your own eyes what the UN can do and can make, uh, how much difference they can make in the field. Um, so um, I totally agree with Richard. I see a parallel between the EU and the UN when, when it comes to public relations. And I'm, I, don't, I, I worked on press and information and public diplomacy issues in the past, also at NATO in my, in my national capacity. And I really think that we need a new narrative, not only for the EU, because we are struggling here to explain to the EU taxpayers what the added value of the EU is. And obviously it's a rules-based uh, uh, group of countries that share the same values uh, and, and norms. And it's eroded from the inside by countries like Hungary and Poland. But we also need a new narrative on multilateralism and on the added value of multilateralism. And I, I think we obviously not only need professionals to do that, but we also need politicians to come up with a new narrative. Um, so that's what I hope for. Uh, and I see a huge role for young people here. Um, I think the role of youth is uh, under, underestimated in the decision-making processes and is also undervalued and they are underrepresented. Um, so I think we need to make an effort there. Just a youth envoy at the UN, who is doing a terrific job, by the way, is simply not sufficient. We need more um, systematic, systematic involvement of young people in our decision-making processes. Wow, terrific. Well, it sounds like uh, you're both in agreement on there's a, a future role in this and that the importance is that part of it is, is telling the right story about what's actually going on 
the real work that the UN does as opposed to what the publicity here is about that. But thank you both. I know we're at the end of this moderated discussion and we're gonna take some questions, but um, it's been really informative and thank you so much for your opinions um, and your insights. So I think what, right now, um, Courtney and Brian, is it okay? We're gonna to go to some questions from, the, from everybody. That sounds good. All right, so let's see where we're gonna start here. Um, Following up, Gerton, I think this one will be interesting for you. Uh, someone asked, going off, going off that, what advice would you give to young people interested in starting a career in supporting the UN? Well, obviously, it's important to be extremely open-minded, be interested in different cultures, travel a lot. Well, obviously, now with COVID, it's, it's impossible, that I'm, but I'm really focusing on the post-COVID uh, <laughs> time ahead of us. Uh, learn different languages. We uh, love that enthusiasm, by the way. <laughs> uh, yourself in different cultures, you know. I mean, what it's, you know, it's, it's the fascinating aspect of being a diplomat is to, to try to put yourselves in, in the shoes of someone else and try to really understand where he or she is coming from. What does, what makes him or her tick? Why is he or she saying what he or she is saying? So you have to listen very carefully and you have to also to pay attention to body language and you obviously need to be a smooth operator in the corridors, et cetera, but you have to be extremely open-minded and also be able to, to at a certain moment, put your own ego uh, in the fridge and, and, and open up to others. Uh, so that's, that in fact would be my advice to, uh, to, to young people. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, career uh, and I'm always happy to talk to individuals who would like some more personal advice. Obviously you need an academic degree, uh, uh, the competition is huge nowadays, everybody has, I think even the interns nowadays have PhDs. Um, and it's extremely tough to get into the UN or into the diplomatic service, but uh, it's it's really worth it. Uh, it's one more thing, Lisa. It's and and we've talked about it before, and and you know my uh, my better half uh, personally as well. It is um, it can be hard on the family. My my wife is the most flexible woman on earth. Uh, and I admire her incredibly because she has to, you know, reinvent herself every three, four, five years. The kids have to go to different international schools all the time. And yet, yes, they are privileged, but still you have to make new friends. You have to get used to it, to different teachers, a different curriculum. Um, so the, the whole spouse element is something that people really have to keep in mind. And luckily now, and well, luckily, because there are many more dual careers, it is becoming more and more difficult, but um, at the same time, I'm very happy that people have dual careers. So that's, I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, terrific, we'll do that. Why don't we ask another question then this one, I'll, uh, I think Richard, maybe you'll take that. Someone is asking about, what about the UN leading the international efforts for developing digital infrastructure? Well, I think, I mean, this is, this is a major focus in New York at the moment. And um, it's something which as a COVID, uh, Secretary General Guterres was really emphasizing and the UN was um, uh, talking a lot about um, finding positive uses for uh, digital techniques, um, promoting international cooperation around digital and also um, addressing the digital gap, the fact that there are still large parts of the world that are not um, plugged into uh, uh, even the current generation of technology, let alone what's coming down down the pipe. And that is an area where you know, other actors, including the European Union, have been quite active in, in recent years. Um, but, you know, it, it's definitely a focus for, for, for the UN. Um, the problem is the dark side. Uh, it is much harder to get cooperation around um, dealing with uh, cyber weapons, for example. And there's a fairly obvious reason for that. The five permanent members of the Security Council all have uh, quite advanced um, cyber programs. And they don't particularly want the UN to um, limit their uh, um, in, in. So I think it, it, it sort of comes back to a version of what I was saying before, which is I think the UN does have an important role um, in especially assisting less developed countries to catch up on digital, but it's not clear that in the security realm, when it comes to dealing with some of the threats associated with new technologies, 
um, that the UN can be uh, so efficient. Although there are there are very smart people sitting in UN headquarters trying to find ways to affect the cybersecurity debate. Yeah, I think that's a really, really good, really good points, Richard. And also in general, cybersecurity is really one of the sort of the foundational new securities that we're all going through right now. It's communications. Everybody is uh, communicating digitally right now, especially in a post-COVID war. Thank you. So another question is, um, and I'll let both both of you sort of take a stab at this and see what, what you think. Do you think there is merit in the idea of re-examining the makeup of the permanent members of the Security Council? Is that a taboo? Well, I can, I can okay. answer that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Fantastic. Uh, look, I, I worked on Security Council reform for a few years and acted as an advisor to um, uh, some diplomats working on that. And it, it was a total waste of time. Um, the, the, the theoretical answer is yes, totally. We have a Security Council that is um, representative of the world of 1945, and that is uh, clearly unjust and probably unsustainable over the long term. But in the short term, um, it is politically impossible to reform the membership of, of the council and the structure of the council because, mm -hmm. for example, China absolutely refuses point blank to consider any reform that would allow Japan, probably India, to get more power in the Security Council. And um, you know, even within the European Union, you know, Germany feels that it, it is entitled to a permanent seat in the Security Council, but um, other European countries such as Italy um, are, are opposed to that. So there's just no consensus on how you would reform it. So I, this is another reason why I wonder whether, you know, the UN may flourish in other policy areas such as climate management, but I, I worry the Security Council just cannot change and that will, uh, that will sort of sap its credibility over time. Mm. That's for sure. Gerten, do you want to add anything to that or? Well, I, I fully concur with Richard's analysis. Um, there is also no common EU position on this, obviously, uh, because there is internal disagreement. Um, some, some in, in previous gatherings, some people have uh, suggested that the EU as such would, uh, would uh, join the Security Council, or well, that will uh, invoke the same negative reactions of others. And, and then there's obviously also the, 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 the weight, uh, because now we have a permanent member and sometimes non-permanent members, but that non-permanent number is changing. Uh, and obviously I'm, I'm very frank here, but as, when Brexit happens, we, well, this is probably the first time I'm in a meeting like this where Brexit did not come up, but that's probably because <laughs> it's, it's incredible, uh, in, at least in the context of the European Union, but it obviously freaked out the French at the beginning because what we are trying to do as European Union is work with the permanent, well, now one permanent member state in, in the Security Council, France, and non-permanent members, Germany is now as a non-permanent member, member of the Security Council, to try to ensure that the voice of the European Union as such is heard in, in, in the Security Council. And when the United Kingdom withdrew, we had uh, we had high hopes that that element would could be increased, but at the same time, it really puts the onus on, on Paris and Paris doesn't want to be the spokesperson of the European Union as such, uh, only when it obviously also uh, serves uh, French interests and, and often French interests serve EU interests as well, but not always. And then obviously you also have to uh, deal with the non-permanent members of the European Union and the Security Council. So um, just a, a bit of background there uh, of what we have been working on in the EU delegation in New York when I worked there uh, up to a year ago as Chief of Staff. Terrific. Well, thank you both. Um, another question. Um, here's one that sort of switches it from about what the role and what we're doing with the UN. It says, in the past few years, the UN has, has spent a huge majority of the countries focusing on Africa and Asia, and it tends to neglect the needs of European and even Eastern European countries. How is the UN going to help European countries that could use more international help? And um, should I give it to you, Gerten, first, given that you're the EU expert? Yes, well, uh, 
There are a couple of EU countries that have EU presence on the ground, uh, but obviously it, it often depends on the stage in which the country finds itself in. Um, I don't know exactly what triggered the question, um, uh, but, but in, in that sense, there are UNDP projects going on in certain European countries. There is a UNHCR being active in, in, certain, uh, in certain European countries where the refugee crisis uh, is, uh, is happening. Uh, obviously, the International Organization of Migration has activities. Um, so in that sense, uh, you cannot blame the UN for not being active in certain European countries because it says more about the, state, the stage of development of European countries. So I, I find that I find it a bit of a difficult question to answer. Um, what we, for example, have seen uh, also in the Security Council is 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 the the, the 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 fading attention, for example, on the on the crisis in in Ukraine, uh, and especially with the focus on Crimea and the role of of Russia there. That's a complaint we often received when I worked for the EU delegation in in um, in New York. Why isn't the EU doing more to put that back on the agenda? And obviously, there you 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 have to do that in, in close collaboration with other key key players and with the big big members of the Security Council, uh, and that could, I know that that concerned a lot of Europeans. Uh, but there's there's only so much you can do here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Richard, anything you want to add on that? No, I mean I think um, you know it, it is worth recalling that uh, in the 19th. 90s uh, European governments did experiment with giving the UN a major role on the continent and that led to the fiasco that was um, Bosnia and um, since, uh, since the Balkan Wars and since the, the failure of the UN um, to handle the Balkan Wars uh, most European policymakers have had a tendency to say uh, we love the UN in Africa um, we need the UN in the Middle East, um, but we don't really want it on our, our doorstep. And that's been true of Western and um, Eastern policymakers. Um, that, that said, I mean, the, you know, the issue now, the focus has shifted to Ukraine, to Nagorno-Karabakh, and it's a simple geopolitical reality that, uh, you know, Russia is not really going to... Uh, offer the UN a decisive role in those conflicts, although UN aid, aid workers um, are getting supplies to conflict affected communities in, in both the Caucasus and, and Eastern Ukraine. So there is still a sort of a residual role as, as Gerson says. Great, thank you. Another question, so, uh, someone is asking about, please tell me what are the impediments to seeing the fruition of the request made by the UN Secretary General ceasefire in all conflicts on UN day, um, SG um, renews call for global ceasefire silencing the guns. What do you uh, both think about that, Mesa Richard? Maybe you start off with that one. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've done quite a lot of work on this this year. Um, the, so, so the story is, um, on the 23rd of March, as COVID was sort of suddenly escalating everywhere, Secretary General Guterres called for a global ceasefire to facilitate um, the humanitarian response to the pandemic. And about two weeks, it suddenly, it looked like the, mir the miracle could happen. Um, not universally. But we saw armed groups from Colombia to the Philippines to Burkina Faso acknowledging the UN call and pausing violence. And um, in a very, very dark time, it suddenly seemed that maybe this was a glimmer of hope, that we could see a series of ceasefires, um, also in places like Yemen, to facilitate the response to the disease. And then it all sort of dissipated and fell apart. And, the armed groups that had acknowledged the ceasefire call returned to violence. Um, why did that happen? I think uh, three basic reasons. Um, one is that actually a lot of the people recognized the ceasefire were largely doing so for tactical reasons and seeing if they could use it to gain advantage, um, uh, political advantage in their own uh, conflict zone. And they concluded that they would not. 
Um, the second reason was that the Security Council, and I touched on this briefly, um, completely mishandled the call. And because of tensions between uh, China and the US over the origins of the virus, uh, China and the US blocked um, the council making any reference to the ceasefire call until July, by which point it was far too late. Um, the last factor, weirdly, is the nature of COVID. Back in March, there was this sort of sense that this was a massive disaster, that it was going to hollow out societies, that it was going to overwhelm fighting groups. That's not how COVID works. Um, mm. It's not like Ebola. It doesn't sort of completely cr um, crush uh, societies. It's an insidious disease. It's a slow moving disease. And quite frankly, for a lot of people who have been fighting and risking their lives in places like Ukraine or Yemen, um, uh, the disease doesn't seem that important. The risks of the disease seem that great. And actually, they're more focused on their existing political goals than fighting COVID. And we saw this in the Nagorno-Karabakh war, which was associated with an uptick in COVID in the countries involved. Um, but at the end of the day, both Armenia and Azerbaijan were more focused on fighting over Nagorno-Karabakh as they have for 30 years in dealing with the disease, which is you know, mm. a tragic story. Mm. Gertrude, would you like to add anything on that? I have nothing to add, Lisa. Okay, <laughs> fantastic. Here's another one about um, types of technology. Um, how can new types of technology advance peace and reconciliation efforts? Are there any new technologies like that? Um, Gertrude, I want to start with you on that. Yeah, Richard already pointed out how the UN is trying to position itself in this whole debate about uh, IT developments, robotics, artificial intelligence, uh, and, and, and related privacy issues. Um, and obviously, the UN has a huge role to play in, in mediation efforts. Uh, Richard also referred to that as well. Uh, I think, and it's more of a general question or a general answer from my side in, in the sense that uh, I've, I've, I never would have thought that I would have UN meetings or EU coordination meetings from, from my office where I am now. Uh, and actually, some of those meetings have been very efficient and very effective. Um, don't quote me on this. I know it's going on YouTube, but uh, what I saw in the EU is that people try, uh, mem EU member states focus much more on what they really would like to achieve. And I just went through um, the uh, governing body of the ILO and it was remarkably efficient with the chair in, in India and, and with some people in the ILO headquarters here in Geneva and me sitting uh, where I am right now. Um, so it might have a huge impact on, on future, the future conduct of business. It will definitely have a huge impact, I think, on, on travel. And I love travel, I really regret it. And I am, I, but, but, you know, I think it's, I've been to, honestly, I've been to meetings for half a day, uh, you know, spending a fortune uh, of, of the, the, the EU taxpayers' money. And it's, it's act it was actually not worth it. And I already knew it back then, but I sincerely hope we can, we can, we can, yeah, we can make it even, make it more, even more efficient and, and, and use technology to that extent. Terrific. I think, I think Richard, you've answered some of that. Why don't I ask you this next question, Richard, then um, do you think the UN will change and become more business supported organization by including the corporate world? Wouldn't it be a change of the basic UN charter? Uh, again, you have to differentiate between different parts of the UN. Um, I, I don't think we're going to end up in a world where, for example, um, big corporations pay for mediation efforts or peacekeeping efforts. Those are fundamentally political um, exercises that require the authorization and support of states. But as I said, in the health sector, well before COVID, I'm seeing philanthropies and private companies in many ways surpassing a lot of governments as um, major donors. And I can, I can completely imagine over time uh, you know, the development efforts of some parts of the UN um, similarly becoming much more private donor driven. Um, equally in the uh, 
in the humanitarian sector, I mean, organizations like UNHCR receive quite a lot of private funding, in fact, um, although their still states um, remain dominant. But yeah, I mean, I think it's been an ambition of the UN, at least since the turn of the millennium, to, to sort of work more closely with private companies and so forth. Um, and I think it's largely a very positive uh, concept. The, the one word of caution I would raise, though, is that um, private actors, even when they call themselves philanthropies, uh, have their own interests. And one problem we've seen around the WHO is that everyone wants to fund stuff related to AIDS and malaria, um, but there are quite a lot of other diseases that actually just as um, interesting or as sexy for private actors to fund. And those diseases, actually, the WHO um, struggles to, to get the resources to, to manage because you, you don't have the private funding. Mm -hmm. Similarly, in the development sector, there's a risk that, um, you know, some poor countries uh, might just get left behind because um, they're not such a focus for uh, private actors. Um, so you do, you st do still need some predictable funding, uh, usually coming from governments to make sure that uh, you know, the priorities of the international organizations are, are not skewed um, by new donors. Right, so the non-biased thing. Gertrude, it looks like you might wanna add something else into that. Just a few, uh, a few additions. Uh, rules need to be clear when it comes to those financial contributions. It needs to be transparent. Uh, and obviously it should not uh, uh, hamper the, or in one way interfere with the neutrality of the UN. Uh, as such. Makes sense. Well, good. I think you've answered a lot of the, the questions out here. Courtney and Brian, I think that might uh, wrap things up for everybody, but I really appreciate everybody's good questions. And Gertson and, and Richard, thank you for your insights. And it sounds like it's not only been an interesting 75 years in the making, but a new challenge. And it sounds like you're both, both very optimistic about what the UN can do in their core foundational assets of what they bring to the world. And it looks like we're, we're in good hands with people like both of you here helping guide that new future. So thank you very much. And we really appreciate your time and your insights. It's a, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. So yeah, yeah, just, just to echo that, uh, Richard Hareton, thank you so much for joining us today. Lisa, thank you for so masterfully guiding the conversation. And thanks to all of you who participated. There were some really, really wonderful questions in the, um, in the Q&A box. So thank you so much for all your, your thoughtfulness and, and your chatter in there. Uh, just a couple of items. Uh, our next briefing will be next week on December 9th, and that's at 12 to 1. Uh, 115, and that is on the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring, looking at its long-term impacts. Um, we have Safwan Masri, Marina Ottaway, and Shadi Hamid. And what's not on there is that uh, Lisa Anderson, who is the um, head of the American University of Cairo, will be moderating that event. And for those of you who haven't heard from her, she's phenomenal. So this should be another great end time talk. Um, so please, please do RSVP. It is on our website. And there are, uh, if you have a phone there, you can RSVP through the QR code as well. Um, so thank you, everyone. And also, as this is the season of giving, just a plea, we are trying to keep these um, briefings free and open to all. So if you have the means to donate, we would really appreciate it. We're, we're a small nonprofit that is really trying to um, trying to make a difference and keep these conversations um, to, the, to everyone around the world. We have participation from over 80 countries now, which is really phenomenal. So um, thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you to our wonderful panelists and moderator. Um, and we will hopefully see you all next time. All right. Thank Take you. care, everyone. Bye-bye. Everybody. Good work. Thank you.